Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. All in all, if you're hunting out West in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Hey folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buckwild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee. And I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee, the best brew in the West, best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buckwild Coffee. Get yours today. Going live right now. Preview. And let's see what we got. We are broadcasting, and folks, welcome to the third segment of Land and Legacy, Land Management by Matt. Ah, you heard that earlier in the week or the month, I'm, whenever this publishes. And now we have Adam Keith, his partner. And Adam is going to talk about the three factors of food plots. We're going to go into the historical aspects of food plots. Somebody grows some corn, a farmer grows some corn and some beans or whatever, and you eat them. So why not grow your own? And then we're going to go into, um, you got to grow what the deer want to eat when they want to eat it. There's some secrets to that. And we're going to wrap up with... You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna have food plots, have them 365, do the whole year, and there's a lot of reasons for that that we're gonna talk about. So, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Keith, you can find him on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook under Land of Legacy or Adam Keith, and he's partner again with Matt Dye from Land of Legacy. Adam, welcome to uh, Facebook Live and uh, Whitetail Roundup Spring Series. Appreciate it, Bruce. Thanks for having me. I will say one thing. When you say partner, make sure you put business partner in front of that <laughs> with Matt. Point well taken. <laughs> and I've never been fully correct, and you can stone me or whatever with that. But, um, you know, send all comments to whitetailrandu at gmail.com. But they are business partners. That's, that's right. For that's, that's for danger. That's for danger. Yeah, make sure there's a separation there. <laughs> but, um, sure. hey. A pleasure. It's it, it's fun, and we're going to have fun hit today, folks. And, um, you know, I, I hope everybody can see. Um, I cannot see Facebook because uh, I'm in blue jeans, which is a software. So if you write comments, I'll see them later. I'll see them after the show. And we're going to go about 20 minutes, and we're going to talk about the history of uh, food plots, the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes of the segment. We're going we're gonna to talk about where this Billion dollar it isn't a million dollar business, folks. It's a billion dollar business across the country, uh, uh, in the creation and the growth and the tilling and the caring and the feeding and everything to food plots. So take it away, my friend. Yeah. So, like you said, it's definitely a very popular subject, and it's probably one of the most popular questions that we get with our consulting company, 
And, uh, and it's always the question of what can I plant to make my hunting better? And as people have followed along with Land of Legacy, they know that we kind of, we oftentimes talk about more than just food plots. And, and so it's always trying to tie everything together, land management, conservation, but then the hunting aspect and improve the hunting success. And that's where food plots come in for us, of not necessarily the side of planting food plots to make sure our deer are healthy as they can be, but it's more just a supplement of planting these food plots to improve the, to give the additional food, but also make our hunting success higher. You know, think about that and, and just take us back to when you first started hearing about food plots. I know you worked with, oh, um, you know, a, a grant a, a long time. We were interned and did a lot of things from them, but you know, let's, let's go down memory lane because as far as I know, you know, we hunted Eddie's corn, alfalfa, or beans. That's right. I, I, I don't know the food plot history. You know, we talked about that pre-recording, but I would suspect from what I know about food plotting is people, farmers, were planting alfalfa and wheat fields and oats and all these things, turnips, and they realized the deer were liking them and realized, you know, maybe I should devote a little area to the wildlife and, and have that to hunt over. I would suspect that's where food plotting originated. Um, the first food plot that I planted or my family planted, I was right around 10 years old. So that, for me, I've been planting food plots for about 20 years. Um, and I started with planting oats and wheat and then turnips. And uh, it was a, a learning experience for me to start planting the first food plots because we didn't know what the heck we were doing. All we knew was it was replicating a garden for the wildlife and uh, so you know looking back the amount of work we did I can remember the first one of the first food plots we planted uh, and actually it's still on the family farm this area and we call it the old food plot um, to where it was the original one and we would go in with a two bottom plow turn the soil all the way over and then we would come back in with a disc and we'd have to disc it a couple of times just to kind of get it somewhat smoothed out Sometimes we had to harrow it, and then we would broadcast the seed, and then we would try and drag it. There was a couple food plots where early on we didn't have a drag, and we would cut down cedar trees, eastern red cedar trees, and then drag them by hand to try and cover up the seed. That's how far back it goes for me on planting food plots. And, and I remember the first couple of times we did that, we would go in and spray, hand spray miracle grow on them, and uh, we were having turnips just this big <laughs> oh my gosh this is we've died and gone to heaven unfortunately <laughs> at that time at the farm there wasn't many deer so it would be a couple of doe groups and young bucks would come in but we never saw any good bucks on those food plots looking back it was because we were in there every time we went to the farm which was almost every other day we'd be in there poking around looking to see how it's growing so it's definitely uh, it's changed a lot for us yeah it sure has and, and back when i was growing up um I was born in New England, actually Rhode Island, and and my neighbor used to take me trout fishing, and he, we went to his family farm. You know, it wasn't a big farm, 100 acres, 120 acres, but it had the old building. I mean, quintessential, you know, what you think of an old rundown farm, but it had that crab apple. It had that apple orchard, and that's the first buck, that's the first white-tailed deer I ever saw. We'd go in there in the morning, slip in there, and they'd be, you know, munching, or we'd go in the evening, catch some trout, and um and there they'd be. They, you know, bounce away and go, "What's that?" And I mean, this is back when there weren't a heck, whole heck of a lot of deer in in, yeah. in Rhode Island. But it was so, you know, it was wilderness. It was perfect habitat. You think back, and it's just like, so that was a food plot. I mean, apple trees are deadly, right time, yeah. right season. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that in the second part. You know, uh, you got to give them what they want when they want it. Um, I do it. You know, and. I'd be interested uh, for people to write you. How would they get a hold of you if they want to make some comment about the historical aspects of uh, food plots? I, you know, I would be curious to hear how people got started in their first food plots as well. And they can always shoot me an email at adam at landandlegacy.tv or info at landandlegacy.tv or just shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram. And those those are land and legacy uh, handles. So and do that, that folks. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, please do that because um, we're we're going to kind of go down this journey uh, with Land and Legacy for a while, and I'm going to do 
a four series a year, and they'll be in one or two of them. I'm, I'm darn sure of that. Um, and, you know, we want good content, but we want to give you what, what you want. And, you know, so someplace along the line, somebody decided to, to make a little food plot or, you know, they, like you said, they saw it on the alfalfa and said, hmm, you know, we got the old button stand over here and it's, you know, man, I could put a little thing there and, and dig up the dirt and throw some seed and see what happens. And I guess it worked because uh, it, it's just unbelievable. And this is the part where food plot today, it, it comes down to seed, it down to soil preparation. And as you, you know, we've talked so many times, it comes down to, you know, pH value. So walk us through, you know, um, people out there read a magazine and they lease some land. They're going to have it for a few years, own some land. And they really never did anything with it. You know, what do they need? What are their first steps for food plots? What do they need to do to, you know, to do it right? Not stumble along like you and I have, you know, <laughs> and made all the mistakes in the book. Oh gosh. I look back and we did a podcast on this a couple, I don't remember five podcasts ago, but I talked about that process of what we did to the soil health by doing all that. And when you understand soil health, I'll try not to bore everybody with this um, just because soil is one of those things that it's kind of boring. But um, when you think about soil health, if it's healthy, you shouldn't have to make the amendments. You shouldn't have to add as much fertilizer and lime. It should just be everything they need right there in the soil. Um, But when you start turning and introducing oxygen and everything like that and killing off beneficial bacteria and fungi in that soil, it becomes really detrimental. So I think the first thing when you're thinking about adding a food plot, you need to understand of what's the cost going to be and then do I have the equipment to do it and understand the process to have a successful food plot because we see it all the time of somebody plants a food plot, but the amount of expense, the amount of time, and then, frankly, the amount of destruction they did to soil health didn't wasn't offset enough by the amount of growth and benefits they had to the wildlife. It's actually more detrimental. So understanding all that before you plant a food plot, and do a soil test, test it, see how far off your soil health or your pH is, basically, and then look at the cost it's going to take to get it back to where it needs to be, where you can actually have a successful food plot. And we talked to that with Matt, and, and that's where the, the land management plan and, and folks if you're doing food plots and you haven't done a complete land management plan you know over years um you're missing out and, and, and share with the folks why that's that's a true statement you know when, when you look at the expenses that go on in, in land management as a, as a landowner if, if you're focused on just improving and trying to make a plan one of your biggest expenses every single year is going to be food plots you're going to have to buy the the lime and the fertilizer, you're going to have to do the soil test, and you're going to have to buy the seed, then you're going to probably do herbicide, and then you look at all the tractor time and diesel fuel and all that. It gets pretty expensive, um, and so there are ways to help offset that, and that's what a big part of our plan is always let's make the habitat as awesome as we can and as beneficial as possible, but then let's give them this additional supplement in the world, in, in the world of food plots and to where – Everything they need should be in the habitat from food year round. They should have food from January one to December to December thirtieth, to where there's always food available. But then they have food plots just in case something goes wrong. You reach a drought or something happens. You, that's the way you should be looking at food plots, in our opinion. So there's a balance there. I hope you just heard what what Adam said because what you want to do, the land itself is going to produce the food. And if it's missing, there's a lot of ways to get food on the ground without planting the seed. Okay. Yeah. So now, so now you might have feeders, you might have the supplemental minerals that you can do per your state regulations. Great. And you're throwing in food plots. And my thinking when I go back turkey hunting, I'm going to start, you know, figure out basically kill plots. Yeah. That's I'm going to I'm going to hunt off kill plots this year. Why? Because I've killed a lot of deer on on the farm, and I want to see how big I can go, you know, just on the farm. We know there's big deer there, but you never see them, is, you know, for a lot of reasons. But I'm going to go to kill plots and, and set up a series of those and, and move some stands and do that type of thing. Because the deer can live on that farm without ever seeing a food pot. Why? Because it's a farm. It's producing. It has cover. It has food. 
you know, and it has water. The deer never have to leave. And plus, we have a huge sanctuary across the street, you know, that hasn't been ever hunted, you know. You know, you bring up an interesting point. When you say that about, uh, when we're kind of going back to my last statement is, um, when I'm saying everything, let's get everything there, a lot of times we don't look at food in the form of young trees, young forests, the buds, the little the little tiny limbs, um, the young growth, the early successional habitat, the poke berries, the ragweeds, the blackberries, the green briars, all that is extremely good food. So when I'm talking about having food available, that's what I mean is having all that. Then if you want to do your supplemental feeding, you want to do the food plots, that's just cherries on top. That's just the added benefit. So that's what that's what understanding how to manage the land to where you have that available, whether that means harvesting trees, doing TSI, letting young forests grow, grow. basically our very, well, we just released it this morning. Our last podcast was let there be light, and it was devoted on letting sunlight reach the forest floor so we have all kinds of food available. That's pretty much what it is. So food plots um, are a huge benefit, but they can often be, if you're not looking at them correctly or doing it correctly, you're you're doing more damage than good. Interesting you say that. And about five minutes ago or so, you talked about the first inch, um, you know, in in, in the soil, and, and I used to, uh, fish offshore all the time and the first inch of the, within the surface i mean everything happened there because you had all the life in the sea was there why because the plankton and little things yeah. eat the plankton and the big bit bigger fish and it's just a symbiotic relationship you know and, and and you you start thinking about that and it's the same thing with the soil and we need to spend a little time we got you know we got plenty of time on this food plot intro here to talk about and and and, and get specific and, and maybe somebody's got to google some words and that's okay because people understand you know uh the microbes and all the the things that happen in that first inch of soil and if you mess that up man you're, you're hurt so come on uh dr adam let's let's go to biology uh <laughs> 203 or botany two no it wouldn't be botany it would be biology right yeah agronomy and so I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about soil and, and I've heard this put a couple of times that really catches my my mind when you think about soil I mean there is definitely I remember in college one of the first lines I got was all right it was soil science is what the class was the guy walked in and said first thing and the main thing you're going to learn is soil is not dirt and there's definitely you know when he said that I'm like what in the world this guy's off his rocker but it's totally different soil is a living thing dirt is the stuff blowing in the wind that doesn't really have life to it. That's the big difference. Um, when you think about soil, the lines that I often hear is the more we know about soil, the less we know. And when you think about the amount of life that's in soil, the amount of earthworms and bacteria and things we can't even see uh, unless you're using a microscope, there's more life in, health, in one tablespoon of soil, healthy so- soil, true healthy soil, than there is living organisms on the surface of the earth. So it kind of gives you an idea that there's more stuff going on down there than there is stuff going on up here. And uh, and then when we run a plow through there and we bring air and sunshine to that, we're just completely messing it up. And so trying to manage soil is uh, is very important, even more important than, than your food plot. So when you think about it, how important is the food plot? Well, you may you may kill a buck off of it, but the amount of damage that you're doing to the soil for long term damage, um, it may not be worth it. And and that's kind of where we stand. For for years, I was plowing up the food plots and destroying soil health to where I'm fighting the problems now because there's not really much soil life there. Um, so it's hard for me to get a successful food plot. And without adding all these amendments of fertilizers and lime just to try and get something to grow. So healthier the soil is, the less input you have to put as far as fertilizer and lime. The more unhealthy the soil is, the more fertilizer and lime it's going to take just to get crops to grow. So to help a non-farmer, you know, when I go to Eddie's farm and they that farm, it's a hundred year farm. So they've been plowing the same, you know, dirt, turning it over, rotating the crops, doing all that. Does he have to put every year more? Additive, for lack of a better word, I don't know the right word, Adam, to say 
to make his crops grow and get the good Tremendous. yield? Or yeah. how does how does that work? How, do, how does that work for farmers out in Kansas? They're they're five miles square or miles square. Yeah, when you think about farming, there's so much money spent on inputs as far as lime and fertilizer, and then every time you turn the soil, you're just exposing more weed seeds to where you're just you're just chasing your own tail, and so that's where the the no-till farming and cover crops comes in. That's been a huge, huge thing to where we always have the soil protected. That's one of the biggest things is you're giving armor to the soil to where there's not sunlight taking the moisture and taking the life out of it. Um, and then you always have something growing and cycling the nutrients back to the surface to where it's not either washing away in a flood or blowing away in the wind. or just leaching through the soil and getting to so far down in the soil profile that the roots can't reach it. Um, and that's why... Having something always growing, usually diversity is the best, and uh, with the cover crops especially, to where there's always different plants pulling different nutrients and keeping that at the surface to where the next crop can can tap right into that soil, the soil uh, minerals and nutrients, and keep on growing. And it still perplexes me, you know, when I drive from Colorado all the way, you know, to the Midwest, and you know, just square miles of just tilled soil. You can see them out with their John Deere, you know, Power Stroke supercharged. You know, and you know, cutting swaths in the earth and just turning wow. the earth over and leaving it fallow all winter. Yeah, leaving it fallow all winter and turning that soil to dirt. Where, yeah, and then you, I was turkey hunting in Nebraska several years, probably five years ago, and a windstorm picked up, and also we're driving back into town. Turkey hunting was over, and we're like, I can't see ten foot in front of me because there's so much dirt flying in the wind, and that's what the dust bowl was. I mean, and and I, I hate it because when you understand soil health and you drive across the country and you see miles and miles of turned soil, you think, when are we going to learn? Um, because that's exactly what happened during the Dust Bowl. We were just plowing and plowing and plowing, and we weren't conserving soil health, and uh, therefore we had a, a huge disaster on our hands. So um, it's definitely something that makes you want to throw up a little bit when you see all that all that turned dirt. So with, with my kill plots, and I mean, they're, you know, Hundred square feet. I mean, they're they're not going to be, you know, they're going to be positioned, you know, for the wind from a, the food plot and then the stand, you know, positioned for the wind. So do I just go in there and rake and just, you know, or do I put some lasso down and kill stuff? I already or, know where. You, yeah, I know where you're going with this. Is well, this, how do I do that? You know, this, how do, how do I do that hundred square feet? Yeah, this is the dilemma that, I, you know, when I started out planting food plots. It was always, well, we're going to do what the farmers are doing, and we didn't know any better. We were plowing and disking and broadcasting, and that's the way you did it. That's the way Pawpaw did it. That's the way you're going to do it. And uh, as as we started understanding, okay, no-till drill, that's the way to go. We want to we want to use seed planters and never, never turn the soil. But unfortunately, I don't know, 90%, 70%, who knows what it is, of food plotters aren't having access to a no-till drill or have the equipment to use a no-till drill. And so we started trying to figure out ways to do that um, to where we could successfully plant without having to turn the soil, but not, we didn't have the equipment. So using UTV implements, that was the big thing for us. And we basically, um, now we did light disking if we needed to, but we tried to completely eliminate that as well. And so we started using rollers and cultipackers and timing it right before the rain. So we would go in and broadcast the seed and then run the cultipacker or roller over and try to get that seed pressed in the ground where we had a better germination. Now, that's where having a cover crop came in um, even more important, just because we realized that if we were broadcasting on bare ground or food plots that didn't have growth, there wasn't a lot of protection for that young seed um, to where a lot of birds were coming in and pet carrying away the seed. So then it came into, you know, we need to, do this in the spring and always have some sort of cover crop, some sort of diversity and have biomass. And so we planted a mix of seed, like 12 species in the fall, um, which, as you know, you can throw weed out on the pavement and you get the amount of rainfall you need, the appropriate amount. It'll grow to where it's six foot tall and it's not really even in soil. And uh, so we planted all the fall crops and timed it great with rain. It grew up. And in the spring, we had cereal rye, four or five foot tall. We went in and we sprayed it uh, with glyphosate, killed it off, and then we broadcasted the seed and ran that cultipacker and or roller 
over it, or even a drag in some instances. And we had a, a, a pretty good food plot. And we didn't take any equipment other than that UTV or four-wheeler and rolled it over. And basically what that what that um, thatch or that fall cover crop did was it protected those young seeds at a young stage to where they had enough time to germinate and grow to where they weren't getting nipped off by the deer. And then also they weren't getting carried away by the birds before they germinated. And it allowed their, there was more moisture being held underneath there to where they had plenty of plenty of moisture to germinate and then continue to grow up through that thatch layer. So that's kind of how we did it um, at first. Now I'll say all that to say when you're looking at little kill plots, um, these little transition plots, and you're trying to do this without disking it up or plowing it up, you, you do all that disking and plowing within this little food plot where it's already fighting with some of the trees and the surround around the edge or even in the middle of it you're going to already be lacking on moisture just because those trees are capturing it before it ever re reaches the soil. Then you're disking and plowing, and you're taking what little moisture there was in that soil, you're, you're letting it out because of the air and sunlight. So if you can figure out a way to capture that moisture by not turning the soil, you're off to a better start. Um, and that's probably second or third podcast to talk about where I think you said what's best for those areas and there's certainly uh seeds and, and blends to plant in those little areas but that's that's really how we looked at it is trying to do that but it's all weather dependent um there you know you can go out and plant with a no-till drill which is honestly the ideal way of planting a food plot and it can set in the soil for a few days without rain and five days later you get rain it germinates and grows but if you do that you broadcast it and it sets on the ground for five days, it may not grow very good because by the time you did get rain, most of the animals had carried, had picked through and carried that seed away. So that's a, a big problem um, when you're looking at trying to broadcast and roll or plant without a no-till drill is you're, you're more weather dependent. And it can be done, but you're going to have to watch the weather like a, a, a crazy man and go, okay, is it going to rain? Is it going to rain? And then you see a big storm cloud form, and you got to get there and get the broadcast, get the seed broadcasted out. Interesting. I, I hope you've taken note, folks, because I'm doing um, it in my mind, because I know, you know, that certain places, certain stands, and certain locations that um, we're, we're going to do definitely that because, um, you know, sitting on the fields are great, and, and you know, um, right time of year and when everything's right, you know, great hunting. Good food plot. It really is. Yeah. Aspect. It, it, it is. And that's why we constantly say we don't not like food plots. We plant it just as much as the next person, but we kind of look at it and go, okay, when and where, not just let's plant every acre in a food plot. Uh, they're very strategically placed. Yeah. The other thing is overlooked. Um, and one of my buddies, um, Grandpa Ray Outdoors brought this up is, is, all your trails and old logging roads and access roads on the farm or where you walk from, you know, your cabin to your, your, your stand set, you know, every single one of those walkways is a little opening. There's a little sunshine, a little moisture, there's a little everything. And you can, you can plant that with, you know, specific blends. And I'm, I don't know what blend you need, you know, Adam sure does, but, but, you know, think about that, and it's really easy. You just take a little drag, and you turn over the soil, and it drops some seed, and then you you take a roller, just the same kind of roller you do in your backyard when you plant, you know, plant seed there. Smashing down molehills. Pardon me? When you're smashing down the molehills. That's what most people use them for. Yeah, whatever. And you do that, and all of a sudden, over, over time, you're going to have forage. Yeah. And you use perennials. And so, you know, you just keep it every once in a while, drop some fertilizer on it. And all of a sudden, in a couple of years, it's not the grocery store, folks. In a couple of years, you're going to have some good habitat that they're going to meander through and take a bite. Well, just by them pausing, you don't have to do anything. You might have the shot. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? That's right. That's right. Um, I will say one thing uh, that we see a lot is just because – it's an open area. It doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a great food plot either. Sometimes um, this is a problem with food plots, in my opinion. Of They get placed in areas to where just because it's an opening, but that's the one opening that all roads go through, and then they spider web out. 
to where no matter what happens where you're hunting, you always have to drive back through that food plot. That's probably not a good place for a food plot because the deer that do come to it, you're just running them out every single time. And so we try to place the food plots in areas to where we can effectively get to and hunt and get out without the deer even knowing we were there. That's the, that's the most successful way you're going to have a food plot um, success is by hunting those areas we're not disturbing it. Um, now, when it comes to establishing food plots and getting those established, the first couple of years, if you're planting species, it, it, there's always a learning curve to where if you plant a food plot the first year, only a few deer find it. It's not a failure. It just takes some time to get deer conditioned to where that's the best food source in the area, and that's where they start coming to. And with that, folks, we're going to end uh, the first session with Adam Keyes from Land and Legacy. So how do people get hold of you? They're just going, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, um, you know, i got to get a hold of this guy. How do they do that? Well, they can call Matt. Here's his cell phone. Um, <laughs> it's not do that. <laughs> it's not do that. <laughs> it's Adam at Land and Legacy, um, dot TV or info at Land and Legacy dot TV. And, uh, or you just shoot us, probably the best way to do that is message us on Facebook or Instagram. Um, and that's just Land and Legacy. You can get right there on the website, um, as well. And that's landandlegacy.tv. So. Well, folks, I thank you for whoever joined us on Facebook Live. And, uh, this will be up, um, you know, on, on my site, whitetailrendezvous.com, uh, uh, in the weeks ahead uh, and with the series that I've been doing, um, with uh, Land and Legacy, Matt Dye, and Adam Keith on land management and food plots. Thank you for joining us. Hey, folks, a special edition of Whitetail Round was coming. I've asked three companies, Land and Legacy, Rackology, and Grandpa Ray Outdoors, to uh, be part of a series on land management and food plots. So uh, the next few episodes, uh, about 18 of them, in fact, are going to be about land, either land management or food plots. Why? Because people have been asking me a lot of questions. So I went out and chatted with some guys and, and Adam, um, Keith and Matt Dye from Land and Legacy is joining the crew. And, uh, at Rackology, we have Jason Obermiller and Eric Fitzgerald and rounding out the team is Grandpa Ray Outdoors with John O'Brien. Each of them is going to bring a different flavor on what is land management, what are food plots, why you need them, the pros and cons. So listen up to this next series, and um, I sure hope you like them. If you like them, let me know. If you don't like them, let me know what I can do better. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.